today's lesson we're going to be discussing what is an extremely important topic because it really settles all that we are in our relationship with God and that is our understanding of God the one true living God and the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ now we live in a society where there are those that would say I don't believe in God in fact Psalms 14 and verse 1 says the fool has said in his heart there is no God so we certainly do not want to be lumped into that category as a person who is foolish because they don't believe in God I know that I'm speaking to people though that do have a belief not only a belief in God but a great love for God and it's your desire to convey the message of God to others and so when we look at the scripture today remember we're talking about the inspired scripture from our previous lesson and we come to understand God as he has described himself and as we find him spoken of in the scripture in the Bible we find that God describes himself as the eternally self-existent great I am those two words I am help us to understand really the width and the depth and the height of God all in all that he is but we're going to take a look at some of the scriptures to try to understand better who God is and understand that there is one true living God let me read a few scriptures to get us started first of all in Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4 it says hear O Israel the Lord our God the Lord is one in Isaiah chapter 43 verses 10 and 11 hear these words you are my witnesses says the, says the Lord and my servant whom I have chosen that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he before me there was no God formed neither shall there be after me I even I am the Lord and beside me there is no Savior so you can already get a taste from the scriptures of the all-encompassing nature of our God and how he is the one and only none before him none will come after him he is the only Savior that we can have Matthew 28 19 you'll remember Jesus said this as he was giving the Great Commission go ye therefore and teach all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and we'll talk about the significance of that relationship Father Son and Holy Spirit in Luke chapter 3 and verse 22 it says and the Holy Ghost descended in a bodily shape like a dove upon him that being Jesus and a voice came from heaven which said thou art my beloved son in thee I am well pleased now before we talk further about some of the things that the scripture says about God and about Christ I'd like to share with you some of the things that are not representative of our God you know there are there are these various isms that are definitions of how people define uh, who they think or what they think is God and I want to take a few moments to share with you a few of those that are not biblical views they're not Christian views concerning God the first is materialism now this is not a reference a lot of times people hear materialism and they're thinking that has to do with people wanting money and possessions and so forth this is something a little different in that it's the belief that the universe constitutes all the God there is and that would be God with a little g all the God that there is in other words the the Sun the moon the stars uh, the skies above the waters that's it that's all the God that there is for us to ever know or understand that's not the biblical view another that is not the biblical view is polytheism or in other words that there are multiple gods and you know there are some nations where their religious structure wor worships not just thousands but even millions of gods in their minds but that again is not the biblical view that there are many gods as we started out with the scripture hero Israel 
the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Another of these views that is in error is this idea called pantheism. Pantheism is similar in nature to materialism, except a little different. The belief that God is in all, and all is God. In other words, with pantheism, uh, a tree could be God, but at the same time, God is intermoving amongst the various elements of the earth. And so you find the scripture speaks quite differently as it says God is in all, but also above all and independent of all. So he's not limited to just being in the tree or in the grass or in the river, but instead the scripture says in Hebrews 1.3 that Jesus is the exact representation of his being. And so one of the ways that we're going to discover in this lesson that we understand God better is by understanding Jesus and knowing him better. A fourth view that is uh, counter to the scripture, it's not biblical, is this idea called deism. Deism is a little more complex in that it does acknowledge a creator. It acknowledges a supreme being, a higher power that has put everything into order, everything into motion, so to speak, created the earth, the heavens and the earth, and all that there is, set everything on a, a path of operation, and then left, walked away, never to have anything further to do with creation. Uh, I once heard an example that kind of described it as a watchmaker who made a watch, wound the watch, got it ticking, and then left it for good to just go as it would the way it had been created. And so there's an idea that does attribute all that there is around us to a creator, but nonetheless does not allow for any interaction between us and our creator. And that simply is not a biblical perspective. For example, in Psalm 34, verse 15, it says, The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their cry. Can you hear the personal nature of God that's, that's shown and described for us through the scripture? Psalm 34, 15 says, God is our refuge and our strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Psalm 46, 1. And so these are wonderful scriptures that help us to understand better that we have a God who created all that there is, but at the same time is still desiring to interact with us and to be there, to be our help, to be our strength. If we want to understand the biblical view of God, it would best be described as Christian theism. Of course, theos is the, the Greek word for God. And theism comes from that study of, and so the Christian study of God comes from the biblical record and helps us to understand who the one true God is. He's a God of the universe, but he's also a God who has an ear that's attentive to the cry of his children. Now, I already read from Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3, and in that passage, we come to understand that Jesus Christ is the full and final revelation of God to us. In other words, the exact representation of his being. And so through Jesus, we can understand God better. We can know him better. We can begin to, to get a grip in our minds on the character, the attributes, and the nature of God. In the scriptures, there's something else that's very unique that's revealed concerning God, the one true living God, and this is where our discussion gets a little bit complicated today because we're talking about the one true living God, but yet in the Bible, God is revealed as a holy trinity. And so we have the reference of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And so it's interesting that in the scripture you see these three divine persons, I'll use that term and address that later, named in the scripture, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but each, they have their own distinctive characteristics, their own distinctive operations throughout all of time, and even into this present day in which we live. And so what we tend to do is refer to Father, Son, and Holy Spirit 
as Trinity or as the Godhead. And so I'll be talking about the Godhead as we proceed further, uh, excuse me, forward in our discussion and talk about some other issues as it relates to the Word of God. One more thing, though, before we move on in our discussion, I want to say about the Trinity. Jesus, in John 14 and verse 16, said, I, speaking of himself, will ask the Father, and he will give you another comforter to be with you forever. So the picture that we have in the New Testament of God is that the Father sent the Son, and the Son would then go away after completing his mission on earth and then at that point the Father would send the Holy Spirit to come and to abide within us and to be our guide, our strength, and our advocate, our paraclete as the scripture refers to. And so this is a beautiful thing when we think about the Godhead. You know there is a sense of holiness and a sense of reverence that we feel in our hearts when we talk about God, can you imagine that here we are, the created, talking about the Creator? But we do so based on the record of Scripture and what we come to understand there. Now, I'd like to address two words that I've used already, Trinity and Persons. Because as I talk about God for the next few moments, I'm going to be addressing the fact that God, the Godhead, is shown in Scripture as a trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. How can we reconcile that with the admonition of Deuteronomy 6 and 4, which says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. But first of all, these two words, trinity and persons, as I use them in referring to the three persons of the Godhead, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. These are words that are not found in the scripture themselves. But they are, they are words that help us to come to an understanding of God in a way that is in harmony with the teaching and the principles of scripture. And so as we look at the scriptures today and we talk about some of these passages as, we, as we've already mentioned, Matthew 28, 19, the Great Commission, go and baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. As you look at 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 14, may the love of God, or excuse me, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. In Paul's letter there, he's closing it, making reference to the Son, to the Father, and to the Holy Spirit. And the scripture that we read at the very outset, where Jesus said, I'll pray the Father and he'll send to you, another comforter, the Holy Spirit, to be with you and in you. These are all references to the three persons or the Trinity as we've spoken of. And as I said, again, these are not biblical words themselves, Trinity and persons, but they reflect in perfect harmony the teaching and the principles of the Scripture that help us to better understand who God is in our lives. Now, as we look at the distinction in the relationship because relationship is discussed in the scripture concerning Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And as we look at that, you can see how Christ taught those distinct relationships and how they existed. And that's something that our minds can't quite contain. We can't quite grasp how there can be three that equal one. That just does not seem to work in our logical minds. And this is where we have to take that step of faith, not uninformed faith, but faith to believe the inspired scriptures and to be informed by the scriptures concerning God. And these are the things that are spoken of regarding God. If you were to try to eliminate the teaching of the Trinity, you would be doing great harm to the Word of God because such is spoken of in the Scriptures and even by Jesus Himself in teaching us about the Godhead. And that is three persons in one. Now, I think one of the problems that we have in understanding what I'll refer to as the mystery 
of the Trinity. In other words, there's something about understanding Father, Son, and Holy Spirit that we're having a hard time getting a hold of to really come to a clear understanding. And I believe it's because of the fact that we live in a fallen world. We'll be talking about that in future lessons, but we live in a world that's tainted by sin. And part of the nature of sin is that there would not be unity, that there would be a division, there would be strife and contention that would happen. And oh, how we've seen that in the earth. And how you see it even in your own life, how the enemy would try to, to rise up against you. And even within families and churches and other ways, we see these kinds of things happening. Well, that's a work of the enemy. But you see, God exists totally above and beyond all sin. There is no sin in God. He is a holy God. He is a righteous God and capable of a perfect unity. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in such unity that they are one. And I believe it's just extremely difficult for all of us who have dealt with the fall of man in our own lives and had sin that had to be forgiven because of the blood of Jesus or through the blood of Jesus. I think we have a very difficult, uh, under, a difficult time understanding such perfect unity. But I'd like for you to think of it like this. There is perfect unity, but at the same time, they are unique as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And you do have that representation of three persons. When I say persons, that's that other word, that's just simply a way of denoting the unique characteristics that are attributed to each member of the Trinity. I want to read this from P.C. Nelson. This is something he shared many years ago, a great theologian. And he said this, there is that and this is a little bit of older English, but there is that which constitute him the Father and not the Son. So in other words, there's things about the Father that make him God the Father that are not found in God the Son. Then there is that in the Son which makes him the Son, constitutes him being the Son that's not in the Father. And there is that in the Holy Spirit, which makes him the Holy Spirit, constitutes him the Holy Spirit. It's neither Father nor Son. And then he said it this way, and, and this, this will help you to get at what I'm saying today. Wherefore, the Father is the begetter. And you remember from John 3.16, where it says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten, begotten Son. Well, it says the Father is the begetter. He's the giver. And the Son is the begotten, as we read in that scripture. And the Holy Spirit is the one proceeding from the Father and the Son. And the Holy Spirit is the one that's been given. So these three persons of the Godhead are in a state of perfect unity so that we can say there is one God. So the Old Testament revelation of of Deuteronomy 6, 4, uh, telling Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, is just as accurate and just as real in the New Testament whenever it speaks of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And it's because the Godhead works in perfect unity. Never does the Son work against the Father or the Holy Spirit against the Son. It simply does not and cannot happen because they are one. So while there's a unique identity of the three persons, there's also perfect cooperation that happens when they are together. Let me give you a few scriptures to read. And these are a little bit longer passages, so we won't read them all right now. But John chapter 5, verses 17 through 30 verse 32, and also verse 37. That's a great passage to read, to read more about that identity and yet cooperation. In John chapter 8, verses 17 and verse 18, it says, It is also written in your law, 
that the testimony of two men are true. And then Jesus, these are the words of Jesus, makes this reference to the Godhead. I am one who bears witness of myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness of me. And so you have that interaction and that relationship between the persons of the Godhead. Now let's look for a moment specifically at the title, Lord Jesus Christ. This is a proper name that's given for Jesus, and it's a name that's only given in reference to Jesus. This is another characteristic of the Godhead that you discover these specific names, these characteristics that are attributed to one but not another. So here in the New Testament, you can read it in Romans 1, verses 1 through 3 and verse 7, and 2 John chapter 3. You never see that reference, the Lord Jesus Christ, in any way representative of the Father or to the Holy Spirit. And then you look in the scripture and find out the Lord Jesus Christ means God with us. You can take that from the scripture of Emmanuel, God with us. It's a reference to the fact that the divine came, the eternal God came to live and to dwell in human flesh. So we have Jesus being referred to as the Son of God. But we also have him referred to as the Son of Man. And these are distinct references to help us to understand the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ, which we're going to talk about a little further in a few moments. It's going to be very important to understand the uniqueness of his deity and the fact that he too, Jesus, was eternally self-existent. Existent, and he is a part of the great I Am as the Father and as the Holy Spirit. Let me read this to you because this, this will help. The Lord Jesus Christ as to his divine and eternal nature is the proper and only begotten of the Father. But as to his human nature, he is the proper son of man. He is therefore acknowledged to be both God and man, who because, of, because he is God and man is Emmanuel, God with us. So when we talk about the title Son of God, we're actually understanding the connection between God and man. Emmanuel embraces God, the Son, coming into human flesh, connecting with man, of course, for our redemption. And in the fact that he lived in this human flesh was able to be, for us, the Lamb slain from the foundations of the world. So it speaks of the eternity of God, and it also speaks to the fact that Jesus came to live in human flesh for you and for me. So when we're talking about him coming in human flesh, another word that's often used is the word incarnation. But we want to make clear that the incarnation did not make Jesus the Son of God. No, in fact, it was the Son of God through the incarnation coming into human flesh that we were able to have Jesus to walk the earth and to be that express uh, understanding and example of who God is in the earth today. The revelation of God to us. And so we understand that he has always existed just as the Father and just as the Holy Spirit. And it's important to know that. And then we find out how Jesus lived that sinless life, became the sacrifice for sin, paid the price at Calvary, and we'll look more at that in a moment, and then was exalted to the right hand of the Father. And so having been made both Lord and Christ, there seated at the right hand of the Father, he sent the Holy Spirit that we would be able, in the name of Jesus, to see every knee bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. So you can see there's such a wonderful plan that God had, and the Godhead has been a part of all that we are to know and understand in God's redemptive plan for humanity. And so we have the Father, we have the Son, and we have the Holy Spirit. And there is honor to be given to the Godhead as we worship the Lord and reverence Him. I want to give you a few of these scriptures that you can take and look up on another occasion, but Hebrews 1, 3, I read that one earlier. 1 Peter 3, verse 22. Acts chapter 2, verses 32 
through 36. I think that would be a good one for us to take a look at real quick, and I'm pretty close to that one. Let me go ahead and read it, because this is on the day of Pentecost, and the Holy Spirit's been given, and the preaching of the Word is going forth. You know how Peter stood up and made those declarations. Let's, let's read these verses, starting in verse 32. This Jesus, and this is a part of the sermon on that day, this Jesus, God has raised up. So Jesus, the Father, has raised up. That's the reference of God. Of which we are all witnesses, therefore being exalted to the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit. So as Jesus was exalted to the right hand of God, who is the Father, the Father grants that the promise of the Holy Spirit uh, would come forth. He poured out this which you now see and hear, that Pentecost experience. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he says himself, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. And then he says, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified both Lord and Christ. So by declaring him Lord and Christ, he was declaring his supremacy uh, his position as God, Son of God, Son of Man, and that He was the Anointed One. That's what Christ means, the Anointed One or the Messiah. And so it was a powerful declaration that's seen there in reference to God. And then I'm going to read one other passage and then I'll just mention these others. Romans chapter 14. Romans chapter 14. And I'm going to start at verse 11. Romans 14 and verse 11. It says, For it is written, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So there will be a reckoning one day of those who will bow themselves before God. They'll bow a knee to Him. But the good news is, is we have by choice done so, submitted ourselves to our great and wonderful God, so note that scripture, Romans 14, 11, and then also 1 Corinthians 15, verses 24 through 28. I want to read one other passage. It's found in Philippians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, and then we'll move on to talk a little further about the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, that's Philippians, and Philippians chapter 2. Philippians 2, and I hope you have your Bibles there as well. Philippians 2, verses 8 and 9, and it says, And being found in appearance as a man, speaking of Jesus, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore God has also highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven and those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. So the Godhead is such a beautiful thing. We're to adore, to adore the Godhead, to worship God and to understand God in the relationship of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. All that have worked as one God in perfect unity unique in their expression, but totally, completely unified in a way that's actually beyond the comprehension of what a fallen man can really understand. Even after we've been redeemed, it's hard to grasp the perfection of that unity, to walk in perfect unity and yet be unique. Now, the second part of this lesson is to focus on the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is so important. This is what makes Christianity most distinct from all other world religions because of the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'll just highlight a few points uh, before we close the lesson today. First of all, the Lord Jesus Christ is the eternal Son of God. And there are some unique characteristics or things that you can see in the Scripture that identify him as being just that. One is his virgin birth. In Matthew chapter 1, 
Matthew chapter 1 and verse 23, it says, quoting from the scriptures of old, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. You remember how God selected Mary. He showed favor to Mary to be the mother of Jesus, but Jesus was not conceived by man, for she had not yet known a man, instead was conceived of the Holy Spirit. That's why you can read in John chapter 3, verse 16, the great passage of love, that Jesus was the only begotten of the Father. So it was a virgin birth, which of course makes it a miraculous birth, something that could only happen by heaven's intervention. And so we read of that in Matthew chapter 1, verse 23, as we've read, and also in Luke 1, 31 and 35. A second thing about Jesus that points to his deity is that he lived a sinless life. He lived a sinless life. And those of us who've walked here in the flesh, as we all have, uh, this one is, is very difficult to co comprehend that he was capable of doing so, but he did it. And he did it for you and for me. In Hebrews 7 and verse 26, the scripture says, For such a high priest was fitting for us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and has become higher than the heavens. In other words, he was untainted by the sins of the world. He was not one who was taken by the lust of the flesh, the pride of life, and the things that tend to tempt a man in this world. He was tempted in all ways as we were, or are, but he was without sin. It tells us in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 22, but it has happened to them according to the true proverb. Oh, excuse me. I think I've jotted down the wrong reference there. So we'll look that up on another occasion. But <clears throat> first, P oh, I'm in Second Peter. That explains it. First Peter chapter two, in verse twenty-two, who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth. So Jesus lived a sinless life. Jesus did miracles. Peter spoke of that in Acts chapter 10, verse 38, when he said how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and power, who went about doing good, healing all who were sick and oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. In Matthew chapter 9, beginning at the 35th verse, it says, Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. So Jesus was a miracle worker, which points to his deity. His substitutionary work on the cross. In other words, Jesus went to the cross in our place. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 3. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 3. But also in 2 Corinthians 5.21. He who knew no sin, that's Jesus, became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. He went there in our place. He was our substitute on the cross. Another point of his deity is his bodily resurrection from the dead. Do you know Jesus really died? I know you know that. But that's the point that we're making that we want to share in this doctrine is to help people understand that he really died. His body was dead. His heart was not pumping. Blood was not flowing. There was no physical brain activity. But his spirit lived on. Scripture tells us in Matthew chapter 28 and verse 6, Matthew 28, I'll get there, pardon me. 28 and verse 6, He is not here, for he is risen. As he said, come and see the place where the Lord lay. In other words, they went to find a body of a dead man, of course, only to discover he had been resurrected. There was a bodily resurrection from the dead, no longer there. Another reference for that is Luke 24, 39, and also 1 Corinthians 15, in verse 4. And then finally, his exaltation to the right hand of God. And we read those passages earlier. 
from Philippians 2, 9 through 11, Hebrews 1, 3, Acts chapter 1 and verse 9. After he said, you'll receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon me, then in, in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the uttermost parts of the earth, then he ascended up into the heavens and went to be at the right hand of the Father. So there's so many indications of his deity. He was not just a good man. He wasn't born and then God anointed him to be the Son of God. He was eternally existent as the Son of God and came and lived in human flesh. So it wasn't his incarnation that made him deity. It was that he was deity. He came and lived in human flesh to be the sacrifice for you and for me. We serve a wonderful God and a God who did all that we needed to be redeemed. And so when we think about God, it should cause us to just exalt and to bless the Lord and to give Him glory. So remember, we serve a God who is Holy Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. They're in perfect unity, yet they're unique in their expression. And we understand the strength of the message of the deity of Christ that he came to redeem mankind and was an offering of our Father, working through the Holy Spirit in the earth and then giving to us the promise of the Holy Spirit as he was exalted to the right hand of God. Thank you and God bless you.